Welcome everyone to the second Echidna Scholars Dialogue, Transforming Pathways in the Global South for Young Women to Work. My name is Jennifer O'Donohue and I'm a Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Center for Universal Education at Brookings, as well as the Coordinator of the Echidna Global Scholars Program. The Echidna Scholar Dialogues aims to provide an ongoing space for researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and advocates to engage in evidence-informed conversation around pressing issues related to girls' education and gender equality in the Global South. In today's conversation, we will focus on the links between education and the world of work, exploring the gendered structural and social barriers that keep too many young women in the Global South either economically inactive or in unpaid or underpaid informal jobs. As in all of our Echidna Scholar Dialogues, we will have the opportunity to hear from Global South researchers and practitioners at the forefront of the movement for gender equality in and through education, who will guide us in exploring critical changes needed in tertiary education systems, education to employer interfaces, and entrepreneurial policies and practices. Our agenda for today is as follows. First, we will hear from three of our Echidna alumni scholars, Arunduti Gupta, Mayala Abu Jawar, and Nima Shering, who will share with us their work on the ground in India, Jordan, and Bhutan, respectively. Our invited guest, Shrayana Bhattacharya, will then respond to these opening presentations, bringing into the conversation some of what she has learned from her more than 15 years of on the ground research. We will then move on to a Q&A session with the presenters where we will be able to go a bit deeper in response to some of your questions. And after this, we will move into breakout rooms where you will have a chance to meet others with common interests and share some of your own experiences, learnings, and questions. We'll then return to the large group to hear the highlights of these small group discussions and close out the workshop together. We want this session to be as engaging as possible. So throughout, we'll use a few polls, the Zoom chat, some Padlet exercises. And we're also really excited to have with us today a graphic recorder, Rajasi Ray, who will create a real-time visual synthesis mapping key ideas from our conversation. And we'll spotlight this work on the screen at specific moments during the session, but please feel free to check in on her work in progress at any time. Um, and now just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. We are recording this session and we'll be posting it to the Echidna Scholars event page. So please know that your participation today will be public. We ask that you please keep yourself muted until the breakout room portion of the workshop. If you want to ask a question, please use the, the chat, um, type your question in the chat, who your question is for, um, et cetera. And if you want to comment on this conversation in social media, which we encourage you to do, um, please do so using the hashtag Echidna Dialogues, which I believe we will paste into the chat for you. Thank you, Leah. Um, and now before we move on to our first uh, presentation, we'd like to do a quick poll um, to get a better sense of who's in the room with us today. And so to do that, we will um, launch this poll now. So please let us know what region um, you're based in, where you're joining us um, from today, what your primary role is in relation um, to today's topic. So are you a researcher, policymaker, practitioner, student, advocate, funder, something else? And finally, what you're hoping to get out of today's session. Um, so please go ahead and let us know. Um, and we have about 30% of people answering so far. So we'll wait just a few more minutes not minutes, seconds, <laughs> um, to get that taken care of. Okay, okay, we have about 60%. If we could get to 70 or 75, that would be great. Okay, last chance. If you haven't um, responded to the poll yet, please do so now and Last moment, last moment. Okay, we'll end the poll then and share out the results. Um, so as we can see, um, about half of us, are, half of you are joining us from North America. Then we also have folks joining from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from South Asia, from the Middle East and North Africa, East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe and Central Asia. So it's great to see that we have a really diverse group from all over the globe. Um, and in terms of primary role in relation to today's topic, um, seems that practitioner 
um, wins with about 38%. Um, we also have uh, many researchers, a few policymakers and students, some advocates and some people who, um, some funders and some who put themselves in the other category. So again, it's great to see that diversity in the room. Um, and what are you hoping to get out of today's session? Um, wonderful to see that so many people are, are interested to learn about the issue, um, connect with others and network and also to take action on the issue. And I just realized, I apologize, I wasn't sharing the results, <laughs> but just speaking through them, apologies for that. Um, but you'll be able to see that. So anyways, it's just really nice to see that we have this diversity um, in the room with us and that will um, really lead us into a rich conversation. So now onto our presentations. Um, our first speaker today joins us from Bangalore, India. Arunduti Gupta is the founder, trustee, and CEO of Mentor Together, India's first and largest nonprofit organization that provides mentorship for youth from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. As a 2021 Echidna Global Scholar, her research focused on the role of digital mentorship in promoting young women's workforce participation in India. Arunduti is a World Economic Forum Global Shaper alumna and has served on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council for India and as an International Youth Foundation Laureate Global Fellow. She holds a Master's in Finance from the Manchester Business School as a UK India Commonwealth Scholar and graduated as the top rank holder from Bangalore, Bangalore's Univers sorry, Bangalore University's Bachelor of Commerce program. Welcome Arunduti and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, I'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. So thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Um, I'd like to start by, by saying that, of course, women's economic uh, empowerment or participation is something that is uh, shaped by you know, a complex interplay of many systems, some of them within the household, some of them at the societal level, some of them at the national, at the economy level. Um, so for today's conversation, uh, for about the next five to seven minutes that I'm going to be uh, uh, sharing some opening thoughts, I'm going to be focusing in on one system and that is the tertiary or the post-secondary education system. Um, so this is a system that is typically the three or four years of education that a young person is in between the ages of 18 to 22 um, in different types of universities, technical, uh, vocational schools, colleges. Um, and that's the, that's the system that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, moving to the next slide. Um, this system of, of tertiary education is uh, something that is actually a very pivotal period in the lives of young people itself. Um, and I think it ca it's captured well in this quote from a report that the World Bank had last year, which said that tertiary education is the central hinge uh, for human capital development um, and a fundamental requirement for young people if they're, they're looking at employment in the global knowledge economy. And this importance that's sort of accorded to uh, tertiary education um, is can be seen in data in tertiary education enrollments globally. So if we go to the next slide, um, this shows us enrollments globally in tertiary education for the last uh, 40 years. And actually, if you look at it in terms of it started from a very low, almost under 10%, 5% for women. And if you see by 2020, notwithstanding the dips because of COVID, global enrollments in tertiary education is just at about 40%. Um, and if you see actually the two, the two lines which reflect for, um, for young men and young women, you'll see that today they are roughly at par. So enrollment-wise, tertiary education is at par for young men and women. So if we go back to that central idea, right, that then tertiary education is the central premise for or the hinge for workforce participation, if we are at parity with the former, with tertiary education enrollments, how does the period following that play out? Um, and unfortunately, it plays out with dramatic inequality. So if we go to the next slide, um, if we take just a region of, for example, South Asia, um, only three of 10 
of 10 women, only three of them would be with tertiary education would be active in the workforce compared to eight of 10 men. Um, so that, and by not achieving that second part of that idea, right, that tertiary education and workforce participation, by not achieving that workforce participation piece of the, of the, of the larger idea, we're actually leaving on the table significant empowerment that comes from it for women from having greater bargaining power and in the household to being able to ensure that children go access higher levels of school. So it is really like a glass half empty in terms of this, the, the promise of tertiary education and workforce participation. Um, so if in terms of my work at Mentor Together, uh, Jen mentioned a little bit about it. And with my colleagues, I really look at then the potential of the glass half full which is that today we have unprecedented numbers of young people in tertiary education, 38 million of them in India alone. Um, so if we look at those three or four years of, of education in the lives of young people, there are opportunities for us to intervene um, and, and change and ensure that that trajectory post tertiary education has more equitable outcomes. And our central thesis is that we look at it through three ways. So if we go move to the next slide, um, looking at skills deficits, network gaps, and restrictive gender norms. So the opportunity to really intervene and change the course of these three things during that period of uh, tertiary education itself. Um, so let's talk about skill deficits, right? If we move to the next slide. Um, today, it's fairly commonly accepted actually world over, at least we find that experience in India that uh, you know, formal subject matter knowledge of a technical degree or any degree that is that is being uh, that students are are uh, in, the formal subject matter knowledge is not what makes a student work ready. Because of course, that subject matter knowledge is is evolving so much in the real world that very often it's outdated by the time a student graduates itself. Um, so if you look on the right, the top ten skills that say the World Economic Forum says young people need are often aspects of problem solving, self-management, working with people. Um, and what we find, and Mentor Together works with about 150 different educational institutions in India and many thousands of young people, is that we find that the understanding of the skills need and, and newer ways of learning these skills, uh, mentoring, apprenticeships, that is being accepted uh, a lot and, and that, that no one is challenging that these have to be uh, addressed, so which is a good thing. What I'll add in terms of the skills deficit is that there's an urgent need to change the understanding or the definition of what are work readiness skills. Because if you see this list, it doesn't address, for instance, uh, the highly gendered way aspirations build, the very low levels of self-efficacy and beliefs that we find in young women in India, the many biases and stereotypes that have emerged in terms of caste, religion, gender that we see in India. And I'd like to say that the fundamental responsibility of skill development is to build at the core good people first, not just avatars of competent workers. So I would say that skill development needs this urgent sort of reset in, uh, at, uh, in, at, at the level of tertiary education. Moving on to the networks piece, um, what I see as the opportunity in terms of uh, networks and what we can do with them is to actually provide young women, especially, very rich, diverse networks of role models and opportunities. This entire period of adolescence is where a young woman is looking around her and seeing the opportunities and seeing what those role models actually say, who are the role models and what are they sort of demonstrating through their behaviors, through their aspirations. So in a country like India, where our workforce participation rates have already been so low and falling, a young woman is seeing more examples of what is not possible rather than what is possible. The opportunity presented is through digital networks. Um, there is a very shrinking gap in mobile phone access. So young women are accessing much more mobile phones and an increasing internet user base. What we find in our work is that it's possible to connect a young woman sitting somewhere in Karim Nagar in Telangana to a pioneering woman mentor many thousands of miles away where she not just knows of that mentor stories, but actually actively engages with that mentor to get the support that she needs for her career plans. So networks are what we need to work on during tertiary education. And the last thing that I'll, I'll speak about is, is restrictive gender norms, which in India, I think almost needs like a tectonic level of, of shift, 
especially the norms that say that a woman's primary role is that of a caregiver um, and the huge marriage market penalty that young women face if they plan to work that reflects in this in this quote of a mentee of ours who's 19 and let that sink in that she's 19 and she says that I don't have a lot of time to actually pursue my dreams because at 2021 I have to get married um, and what is the change that that this situation overall needs um, I'd say it's captured well in the quote of uh, one of our incredible mentors um, that's on the on the final slide that says um, if we could move to that that speaks to actually the responsibility that we all have of uh, challenging these these gender norms, not leaving it just up to the young women. Um, and but a, a paper that I read just today said that the sanctions on young women in terms of challenging gender norms are much lower when we work with those that collectively enforce those norms and actually change their mindsets. So the opportunity to actually work and for us through our work, it's through these large champions of mentor networks, um, that we are challenged, trying to work on challenging some of these gender norms so that it's not just a journey or a fight that young women have to do alone. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And I look forward to conversations as we as we move ahead with the event. Great. Thank you, Aranduti. That was really a great introduction. I know you have much more to say, but these are quick presentations um, into some of the systems that need to be transformed in, in order to bridge that gap between women's educational attainment and their workforce participation. So thank you for that. I would like to encourage everyone at this point to drop any questions that you have for Aranduti into the chat and um, you know, for our other presentations throughout the workshop today. Uh, we'll move now to our next presenter, who is Mayada Abu Jabber, who joins us from Jordan. With over 20 years of work experience in women and youth education and economic empowerment in the Middle East and North Africa, Mayada is the CEO and founder of World of Letters, an organization committed to bridging the social, economic, and opportunity divide. Additionally, she is the founder of Joe Womenomics, a nonprofit organization in Jordan that promotes women's economic participation, as well as having worked on influencing national labor laws. As a 2014 Echidna Global Scholar, Mayada researched women's economic participation in Jordan in relation to the national curriculum. She is currently completing her PhD in integral development toward a feminist economy from the Da Vinci Institute and holds a master's degree in environmental geology from Duke University. Welcome, Mayada. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, and wait for my slides. Okay. So I'll start with the first slide. Um, the one before this one, yeah. So this is just, a, no, the one before it. Yeah. So uh, this is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've reached to a feminist economy. And we're still striving to reach to a feminist economy. So this is a picture. Uh, of me with a couple of young girls um, in a farm next to a Dead Sea. And we're sitting here in a circle talking about our lived experiences, of their experiences of finding a job, employment, what are the challenges, and so on. So I thought it was very interesting to start with this one. Um, but, you know, working on women uh, empowerment issues is not something you wake up one day and say, look, I'm going to study. I'm going to start on empowering women and I'm going to start working on advocacy. It's something, uh, it's, it's basically an injustice that happens in your life. So I'm a geologist, as Jen said, I finished from Duke University. And this is a picture actually at Duke University. It was like in the New York Times or something. My professor here is Oren Pilkey. He was very famous because he was advocate for nature. So he believed nature, nature is alive and that development affects nature and that, na that we should live in harmony with nature. So my first real advocacy was with uh, Oren Pilkey, which is my professor, where I was a natural advocate. And I came back home and, you know, uh, back in Jordan, I said, you know, I'm going to become a steward of nature. And uh, I started working at what is known as a natural resource authority as a geologist. And because I was a dermatologist, I wanted to go and work in the field. But the thing is that my boss, and I was still like maybe 22 years old, or 23, and my boss insisted that this is not a job for a woman. And I was among all my colleagues were majority men. There maybe were two women back then. And they said that working in the field is not for a woman. And he would remind me daily that this is not a job for a woman. Go home, you know, do what a job that's actually made for a woman. And when I got pregnant, it get even worse, you know, harassment and the whole thing. So basically I resigned. 
Um, so next slide, I started working on um, what is known as the active labor market programs, ELMP as they call them, demand driven training programs. So basically, as uh, Arundhati said earlier, so there is the supply, which are everybody that's coming out of the education system. And then there is the private sector, which is, uh, which is the demand. And so what I did is I was, uh, if you put just uh, one click, I came in in the space between the supply and demand. I did this for 10 years. And if you have visited Jordan, you'll know that Jordan has a very youthful population. So if you walk in the streets of Jordan, you see a lot of young people. 63% of the population of Jordan is below, below the age of 30. And recent figures say that 47.7% is the unemployment of youth, out of which 64% unemployment for uh, women. So there was a big gap there. And I came in to fill that gap with, uh, by being a service provider. So I worked for more than like, a, uh, so it was very easy, right? So what does the private sector want? We go, uh, uh, we get the youth, train them and link them to jobs. So we did the soft skills. We did the skills that, uh, that were listed. We did technical skills in the hope that they're gonna get employed. The problem is they did not get employed, specifically women. So for the next slide, what happened is we had worked with 4,000 women and we realized that education did not lead to employment. 60% of the girls who actually had contracts with the private sector refused to go to these jobs. And so when they were asked in a focus group of 260, they said that their choice of enrollment into education was their own choice. But when it came to, and training of course, but when it came to their enrollment into employment, it was the collective decision of the family this return on investment, should she work there or not? And it was specifically the main members of the family that made the sole decision. So when I came back from, uh, so I went to Brookings Institution and started looking at the education system. What is the narrative? What is the gender bias in national curriculum? When I came back, my research was featured in this uh, Jordan business um, on, the, on the front page. And you see, you say, is the education system setting tomorrow's girls up to, for failure? Because in my final, um, uh, yeah, mapping, I realized that we are preparing young boys to enter into the labor market, but the young girls are getting prepared to enter into the uh, uh, marriage market. I can elaborate more if you know you have questions about this, but basically there was this big mindset, uh, there was a big kind of component which was stopping girls from entering into the workforce. So uh, the next slide. So, but I started since 2014 when I came back uh, working on uh, the employment, but this time I started looking at issues that were not the belief systems, not the opportunity barriers, so not the skill gap, but beyond that. And every time I spoke to uh, different people, they would say, but yeah, this is too soft. How can you change culture? How can you change mindset? You know, this takes too long. And, and some wouldn't believe, and maybe it's a skill gap, and maybe it's a technical gap, and you know, the whole discussion. But in 2018, the World Bank, uh, uh, yeah, you can put it. The World Bank actually puts this report out, uh, understanding how gender norms impact female employment outcomes uh, in Jordan. And this interesting chart. So Jordanian, both men and women were asked, is it okay for women to work? They said 96% said, of course they should work, right? But they don't know what if she gets married? The number drops to 72% accepting, right? And so these are men and, and women. So, but what if they have kids and they have to leave their children with relatives, not even daycare centers, relatives. It went down to half of them really saying, okay, maybe she can work. But what if she's in a mixed workplace? So there are men and women both, 38%. What if she returns after 5 p.m.? 26%. So basically the, it is not desirable for the community for women to work. It is more desirable for them to stay at home and do the care work. So uh, once this came out, we started working. I, I, uh, if we go to the next slide, I came together with like-minded people. So we were a couple of them. We decided, you know what? We need to set up Geomonomics. Uh, it was in 2017. And we said, we want a feminist economy because we realized that we need the holistic approach, right? So we needed um, an economy which is empathetic, which is caring, which is uh, which is feminist economy. So, uh, and you can see the link to our website on uh, uh, in the chat. So, and so, what did we do? We came together. In the next slide: sixty women and men uh, from different sectors, from different parts of Jordan, and you can see some of them were pilots, parliamentarians, um, all of us who believe in the cause, and we started working together on different uh, uh, levels. So if you go to the next slide, for example, 
we started working with the curriculum uh, department with the members at the Ministry of Education. The slide in the middle, you know, I'm, I'm in red with, uh, with, the, uh, with the curriculum members. And we work with communities using religious nar narrative. So we worked with the religious department, what is called the Ifta department. So we got Mufti, which is the religious leader, to talk to young girls. We did drama, if you can see on the right side in the universities. We worked with the private sector, and we also worked with the agency of girls and women. But there was one thing that we had forgotten, and that was, if you go to the next slide, was actually policies. And when we looked, I looked into the labor law policies, there was Article 69. And in Article 69, um, the, uh, the Ministry of uh, Labor restricts, uh, restricts private sector from employing women in certain jobs. And believe it or not, geology, field geology is one of them, in addition to like a page and a half of jobs. Uh, in addition, they can't work in certain hours in the false kind of a terms of guardianship. At the same time, when you look at Article 29, which, which talks about different, uh, how employees should be behaving and, you know, assaults and like violence in the, in the workplace, there is nothing about sexual harassment. It's not mentioned, it's not defined, it's not even, there are no penalties of also. So now we're looking at uh, abolishing Article 69, we're looking at adding sexual harassment in Article 29. So, so next slide. So, when you come back to this slide that I had prepared in the beginning, what is the active labor market? How can you prepare women to enter the labor force? You have the private sector, and then you have the education system, and you have all the service provided, all this upskilling, all the soft skills and technical skills, but then also what do you need? You need also another click. You can now have a couple of clicks here. So regulations, we need to work on communities. We need to work on local leaders. We need to work on policies and we need to work on education system, we need to work on media. It has to be a whole kind of a holistic approach to uh, uh, work. So currently at Jomonomics, we've reached to more than 600 women in 10, 10 governorates. We are working on labor law, uh, abolishing Article 69, and we're working we've worked with more than 3,000 community members, and we've engaged the community, uh, the media, to help us in our campaigns as well. So this is some of our efforts, and I'm happy in, um, in the sessions of question and answer to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mayada, um, for highlighting your incredible work promoting women's economic participation and what it has meant for, for a holistic movement towards a feminist economy in Jordan. And as Mayada said at the end there, just want to remind everyone to please drop any questions that you have for her or for any of our panelists into the chat now. And without further ado, we will move on to our third presenter today. Um, our third presenter is Nima Shering. Nima is joining us from Bhutan, where he is the lead policy advisor to the Royal Government of Bhutan and has helped shape national policies related to health and education. As a 2014 Echidna Global Scholar, Nima's research focused on improving education quality and supporting girls' transitions to higher secondary school and beyond. Nima was named a Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum, a Policy Leader Fellow by the European University Institute, and a New World Asia Global Fellow by the Asia Global Institute. He holds a master's degree in public administration and international development from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, an MEM from the University of Canterbury, and a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Kansas. Welcome, Nima, and over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jen. Uh, Arena, I wait for your slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Arena. Uh, Im Im imagine a vision or a world where uh, uh, female, for a female default entrepreneur ecosystem, where economic future is female, where future is female, where default is female. So this is the uh, focus I wanted to focus uh, because the COVID-19 has exposed our vulnerability, how women are important to the economy. Economist Joseph Schumpeter, back in 1942, said that creative destruction is at the heart of capitalism, where entrepreneurship simultaneously creates something new while destroying something old for economic dynamism. So key word here is economic dynamism. Karl Marx said capitalism is unstable, which will lead to its own destruction. But Joseph Schumpeter said capitalism's 
unstable because capitalism is unstable, which is why it works. However, today, our current entrepreneurial systems are built on masculine default. Male is the default. Therefore, it is time to apply Schumpeter's uh, theory of creative destruction positively, I emphasize the word positively, to transform the entrepreneurial system toward a female default entrepreneurial ecosystem to harness humanity's full uh, entrepreneurship potential. Uh, this is because uh, <clears throat> women uh, are overrepresented, women entrepreneurs and workers are overrepresented at the base of the economy pyramid. And uh, the disproportional representation of women at the base of the economy pyramid uh, may have its roots in part in girls and young women's limited access to quality education, but in part, in other part, in masculine defaults of entrepreneur policies, practices, or social and social norms. Looking at the Bhutan's uh, gender gap data shows that girls' quality education can have the downstream uh, implication for the economy. In Bhutan, the modern education began only in 1961, and in 1970. Only two girls were enrolled in primary school for every 100 boys. Now, while Bhutan's gender rank ranking for primary, secondary, and from this year, even tertiary uh, for enrollment uh, has reached number one, actually, out of 146 countries, according to the latest Global Gender Gap Report by the World Economic Forum, which is at par with the number one ranked Iceland, you know, developed country. So Bhutan's uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, when you look at education data, is at par with the number one rank Iceland. But Bhutan's gender ranking for economic participation is way below, almost at the bottom, 126th position. So this data uh, indicate that there may be a link between education attainment for girls and young women and their position later in the economy pyramid. And we have uh, heard from experiences of Jordan and India, presented by my colleagues, Maeda and Arunduti, also shed light that education attainment for girls, quality education attainment for girls up to the tertiary level and young women is necessary, but not sufficient to push the women entrepreneurs and workers up the economy pyramid. But, so in Bhutan, we try something in terms of economic uh, entrepreneur policies or practices. So Bhutan's Minister for Economic Affairs, Lognath Sharma, adopted something called uh, Innovate First, Regulate Later. If I may rephrase this, uh, using the concept of creative destruction. No, you destroy the default, male default first, and regulate later kind of concept. So, so he used the concept of Innovate First, Regulate Later, female default entrepreneur policy in June uh, last year, in June 2021 as a part of COVID-19 economy recovery strategy. So using online business registration app where anyone can register for business within a minute from the comfort of one's own home without having to go physically to register, uh, without having to physically to go to the office to register for an entrepreneurial business idea where women doesn't have to worry about safety and lots of other issues. And it so happened that the first entrepreneur who registered in that entrepreneurial uh, that business uh, female default app was a female uh, named Rajni Tamang. And uh, over, the, over one year, when you gather the data, uh, over the last one year from June 2021 to June uh, this year, June 2022, the data showed that female entrepreneur registration rate is much, much higher than the male entrepreneur registration rate. Yes, because we use the technology, yes, the number of male entrepreneur also increased by 91%, but the number of female entrepreneurs increased by 133%, which is, uh, there's a big gap of almost 42%. So when I look at, I know this maybe looks a very uh, limited data, but when I look at all uh, this data, it gives us a hope that we can reimagine a world where economic future is female if we adopt female default entrepreneur ecos uh, ecosystem to harness the humanity's full uh, economic potential. And this is the idea I would like to throw and discuss further. Thank you uh, so much. 
Thank you so much, Nima, for sharing your work on the importance of moving towards that female default um, in the entrepreneurial system and for outlining some of the findings from your work in, in Bhutan. Um, just again, to remind everyone, if you have questions or comments, um, please put them in the chat. We've had a few great questions and comments in there. Um, and I also um, now would like to ask all of you to take a few moments um, to share a bit about yourselves and your thoughts on the conversation so far in our event Padlet. Um, so I am going to share my screen here so that we can um, see that. And I think Leah has just put the, the link into the chat, but really the idea here is for all of you to, you can click on this plus sign um, and share with us what organization you work with, um, anything that has resonated with you from the opening presentations, from these um, three presentations that we've heard about so far. And if you have a resource, something that you have read, watched, listened to, a podcast, a video, an article, a book, um, anything at all, an infographic um, that has impacted your thinking on this topic, um, it would be great if you could go ahead and add it here. We understand that it might take time. So this Padlet will be open and available to all of you, um, not just now and not just during this um, session today, but afterwards it's a living document and so we hope that we can continue to add to it together um, and to return throughout um, our conversation to this so great to see that we have people joining us from the osgood center for international studies from the florida community partnership from my emotions matter from education development center statistics portugal um, Someone wrote about, um, you know, he, he, what resonated with them was the many con uh, conditionalities of allowing women to work. Um, also, someone joining us from Kentucky as well, College of Social Work. Um, so, we're also joining us from Shalom Youth Village in Rwanda, from Winwak, from Joe Womenomics. Um, so, great to see again this diversity of, of um, participants and where people are joining from. Um, and, you know, people uh, interested in seeing those eye opening statistics on gender gaps in education and employment. I agree, they they are extremely important for all of us to have our eyes opened to. Um, so in the interest of, of time, I'm going to, you know, well, as I say, that's a living document and please continue to to add your thoughts um, and comments there and any resources again that you may have. I'm going to um, stop sharing in the meantime and we will move on, but we'll come back to our Padlet um, in a bit. So now I would like to introduce our invited guest, uh, Shrayana Bhattacharya, who is a senior economist at the World Bank Social Protection and Labor Union for, Unit for South Asia. And prior to joining the World Bank, Shrayana works on a range of issues in the areas of urban bureaucracy, social protection, and informality. She's trained in development economics at Delhi University and at Harvard University. Shrayana is also the author of Desperately Seeking Shah Rukh, India's Lonely Young Women, a recently released book based on 15 years of field research, which maps the economic and personal trajectories of a diverse group of women across India. So welcome, Shrayana, and over to you. And I'm here to back you up with the poll, and I promise I will publish it this time. <laughs> yeah, because, well, firstly, it's such a pleasure to be here, and it was so fascinating listening to everyone else speak. Um, I have a sense, Jen, based on just the geographic representation we got early on in the poll, that there might be lots of people in our audience group who don't know who this man is uh, on their screen right now. Uh, his name is Shah Rukh Khan, so maybe we could just do a quick poll just to get a sense of familiarity and I can explain the context and why a Bollywood actor shows up in a conversation on women's employment. I'll come to that in a second. Okay, so okay. we have about yeah. two, two thirds answering. Yeah. Um, Anyone else? Yeah, wanna... it's actually... Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. Anyone else wants to participate or we'll just move forward? Okay, we'll okay. Uh, share the results there. Great. So actually 41% knowing who Shah Rukh is is more than what I anticipated. 
Um, just as background, uh, Shah Rukh Khan, and I can see my other is, is smiling because he's, he's a huge star, not only in South Asia, but in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, parts of Western Europe as well. He's India is one of India's largest, biggest male actors in Hindi popular cinema, uh, considered, you know, sort of the Indian Cary Grant, if I think that's the best way to describe him. Um, 15 years ago, uh, in case everyone's scratching and wondering, scratching their heads, wondering why after such a technical conversation on women's employment, I'm showing you pictures of an Indian actor doing the dishes in a film of his and plating food for his wife. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, 15 years ago, this is in 2006, I was in my early 20s. I was a research assistant uh, working with a feminist think tank in India. Uh, we had a survey we were supposed to do on women who were making incense sticks and garments at home. And, and for those of you who are aware of, I think, the numbers that many of the other speakers presented, most women in South Asia tend to be present in self-employment and work within the home. In fact, 64% of manufacturing jobs uh, for women in India are within the home. So typically women are making garments or tailoring some small pieces of uh, textiles and usually they get what we call a peace rated wage for it. And I was sent to a slum in the state of Gujarat. Uh, this is in the west of India, uh, in the city of Ahmedabad. And I was asked to essentially do a survey of how much women were earning, their working conditions and so on. Now, many of these women were members of actually the world's largest labor union for informal women workers, which is SEVA. I think many of those here who joined us would have heard of SEVA and their work. And as we started to talk about uh, wages and working conditions, many of the women I was speaking to essentially told me that they'd been through this kind of survey before. Uh, in fact, they'd been collecting data on their own wages and working conditions. And they told me they were really tired of city girls from Delhi, like me, uh, showing up and asking the same questions again and again. And they said, can we just talk about something else? So we decided to take a break. And as an icebreaker, I would ask all these women who their favorite actor was, because in a country as diverse as India, where you know there are very few things that really hold us together in common, uh, popular cinema is definitely one of them. I discovered that uh, everywhere I went from the slums of Ahmedabad, I followed up with this work, uh, with a survey on domestic workers, migrant domestic workers who are moving from a state in Jharkhand, which is a tribal dominated district into the cities of India, different parts of the country. And I realized everywhere I went, I met women who seemed to love this actor. And one of the themes I realized, and, and I followed, in fact, the granular texture of the decisions that they were making, these women, when they were thinking about their career choices. And one of the things I realized was it's very hard and I, I, to essentially divorce social norms from technical fixes when we come to women's employment. Um, and, and that makes the problem really tricky. Uh, economists tend to talk in a very technical language. It's a language that's helpful, you know, so it's a language of interventions and you see results. But a lot of the norms around what women's roles are in society, especially around care, uh, what masculinity is supposed to do as well, um, and in terms of norms and the way men are supposed to behave, um, those are extremely endogenous in many of these decisions. And I want to sort of start by saying that I realize that you really can't have a conversation about women's employment without actually talking about care, uh, culture. Um, and this actor essentially allowed me to have these very tough conversations with women over 15 years. You see him here actually doing something that Indian men don't do. And maybe, Ariana, we can move to the next slide. Uh, India, in fact, is in the bottom five when it comes to men helping in housework. That comes from uh, an ILO survey, and I'll show you more detailed results later. Uh, what you have right now in front of you is essentially a graph based on time use data in India. 
uh, looking at minutes that men and women spend per day in different tasks. And you see this huge gap uh, if you look at unpaid domestic services. So women in, usually are reporting spending around 299 minutes, whereas men are spending 97 minutes. In fact, there's data that shows that 66% of women's work is unpaid. Uh, I think Arundhati, Neema, my other, many people talked about socialization and how there is this idea that marriage and caregiving are a woman's primary job. And I want to nuance this here a bit. So many of the women I met through this course of the 15 year research would say, well, I only need to have a job when the man doesn't hold up the breadwinning end of his contract. And in fact, many women would say, trying to manage care work at home in addition to you know, jobs outside while some really enjoyed it for others, it was an underpaid, exhausting disaster. And many of these women, in fact, through the years that I followed them, retreated from the paid workforce uh, because they felt that this was just, A, it was too much to take on and there were norms around safety, access to jobs, and they didn't have enough flexibility in their work jobs as well to be actually able to pursue uh, roles outside the home. And so I do want to highlight that while there are technical fixes, be it the use of technology, job matching, all of those. The question of justice and the roles around care are absolutely critical uh, when we think about some of these questions and what is the role of men and women. Um, can we move to the next slide, Ariana? Uh, so of course, India is not alone when it comes to men not participating in the kitchen like Shahrukh did in that first slide I showed you, uh, which is also why all these women I spoke to love him because he's always portraying these kinds of men who are showing up in the kitchen and helping women with their housework. Uh, this is minutes per day. Uh, if you look at the blue aspect of it, it's domestic services for own final use. Uh, you'll notice that countries like India, Pakistan, Mali, these are minutes per day as well. And these are the minutes that men spend uh, on domestic services. And you essentially find that, again, India is in the bottom five when it comes to men doing housework. And it comes up to be around 31 minutes, according to this particular estimate from the ILO per day. Uh, but you see this pattern in other countries as well. And I'm not showing you the full graph. I'm showing you some of the countries that are in the bottom end of the distribution. Um, be it a Morocco, uh, be it in fact, even China or South Africa, you see this very skewed role. And this has been a really hard problem to crack uh, because women are constantly entering and exiting the workforce with the constraint of care work on them consistently without that being renegotiated. Um, and I think we need to have a conversation about how that can actually be done. Um, and, and it's a conversation I know many feminists and economists are tired of having because you talk about care work and you think this is something that's impossible to surmount, but culture, conversations and justice movements need to attack it or else so many of the technical solutions that are offered, women will just not be able to access them. Uh, simply because they're just too tied up pro providing energy at home. Uh, let's move to the next slide, Ariana. This is another slide which shows public expenditures, the share of GDP uh, in different countries. And you see again, I mean, countries like India, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, this is less than 1%. Um, and there's a lot that governments can do beyond just childcare centers, thinking about remunerating care workers, for example, uh, using minimum wage. Uh, countries like India, again, have not even signed the ILO declaration for domestic workers' rights. Uh, there are no clear minimum wage norms that even uh, apply themselves to many care workers in several countries. And there are questions about how we treat care, remunerate care. Or, and in fact, one of the policy discussions has been in India to provide universal basic incomes to women to remunerate for their care work. That is a critical input without which the economy would just simply not work. And, and you know, my other mentioned the feminist economy. Uh, one of the core principles of the feminist economy is one that recognizes care as absolutely critical to economic production. Um, and that's a conversation that's going to be really important as we move forward. 
Um, so I'll end with just maybe a few responses to some of the presentations. I mean, one, I think, I think it's really critical to think about care very carefully. And I, I think there are lots of ways to do it. We can discuss that during the Q&A. Um, but I do want us to recognize that the, the challenge of transitions between employment into education for women is not a technical challenge. This is a challenge where you're you're essentially fighting fairly patriarchal decision-making systems, not only within the household, but in the policy sphere, in our courts. Uh, just in fact, a few days ago, there were frontline care workers in India who were protesting because they hadn't been paid their wages since January. And then all these women were fired, um, essentially because they're irregular workers. But these were women who were absolutely central, for example, to the COVID care response policies. And if you don't think very carefully about remunerating care, valuing care in the GDP and compensating women perhaps, along with investments in childcare and elderly care, I think this problem of trying to address women's employment through a purely technical lens is probably going to get us nowhere because it is a question of care and it is a question of justice. Um, and I'll close with that. And then hopefully we can come back to some of these themes in the Q&A later and over to Jen again. Thanks. I had a couple of annexure slides, but those we can skip over, Ariana. Thanks. Thank you, Shoyana, so much um, for sharing that research that, that led to your book and for your discussion of the power of some of these non-technical <laughs> aspects um, that you mentioned that can either promote or discourage women's economic aspirations and participation. Um, so at this point, um, we'd like to ask for a virtual round of applause for all four of our presenters. Um, you know, we've had some comments in the chat about really how great these presentations have been with you know so much information and and really the breadth of experience that all of you um, are bringing to the conversation today. So I'm actually thinking of making an executive decision that we um, sort of skip the 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 group big group Q and A and that we move into the breakout rooms and provide that space to have um, a more of a conversation. Um, since we've you know, spent some good time hearing from all of you and listening, we'd love to have um, all of our participants to have an opportunity to engage um, more closely um, with each of you in, in conversation. And there's been some, you know, some great comments in the chat around um, and questions around, you know, what is the role of men in this and how do we engage men um, effectively into this conversation? Mayada, I know that's something that you've been working on in particular. Um, Nima and Narendra as well. What has been the impact of COVID? I think um, Shrayana's challenge to us all at the end to think of, you know, if we don't deal with the whole issue of care and the care economy, then will we be able to really resolve some of these um, other issues about getting women meaningfully into, into the workplace? Um, so would love um, to take these questions with us into the breakout rooms. Um, so what we're going to do today is have three breakout rooms and you will be able to choose um, which breakout room you're going to. Um, they will be facilitated by our Echidna scholars. So we'll have one breakout room with Aranduti that will focus um, you know, more around her work and people who are interested in um, particularly in understanding that um, important opportunity as Aranduti mentioned it of tertiary education. A second breakout room will um, be facilitated by Mayada and, and people who are interested in engaging more around this question around the interfaces of um, education and employment and, and thinking about this uh, move to the feminist economy and, and what has been sort of um, involved in that in Jordan. And then a third breakout room with Nima to think more about um, a female default entrepreneurial system and what will that look like and what does that require? Um, and of course, in all of these, again, to, to return to some of these um, questions that people are putting in the chat around, um, you know, how do we make this cultural shift happen? Welcome back, everyone. Um, I know it's always an abrupt, <laughs> abrupt to be sort of pulled out of the room mid, mid, mid word. Um, so apologize to whoever was talking um, in the moment that the breakout rooms closed. Um, you know, hope that you were all able to have great conversations and really dig a bit deeper into some of the topics. 
Um, and apologies again for the sort of technical difficulties of getting us into the rooms, but hope that once you were there, um, you were able to, to you know, have um, meaningful conversations uh, about the topics. And now I want to open the floor so that our reporters uh, can share some of the big picture ideas that were discussed in each of the breakout rooms. Um, and also to our graphic recorder to Rajasi so that she can help to capture some of the main ideas from these groups. Uh, so why don't we start with Arunduti's group and I believe that Anthony um, was the reporter for that group. Yes, it was. I think, uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. There's, there is a lot of background noise. Um, yeah, yeah uh, forgive me, we have a power blackout. Uh, I'm in the city at the moment and there's a power blackout almost everywhere, so I had to rush to a restaurant for me to attend this meeting. But I'll try as much as possible to, to try and push on the background noise. I hope I'm clear. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, basically, in our know, breakout group, what we wanted to focus more on was uh, uh, how, given the hindsight, uh, based on what uh, experience we've had, how do we ensure that, uh, or what can we do, or what we have done differently, to be able to uh, try and turn the battery, uh, the battery up, you know, Anthony? Exist. Yes? I'm going to interrupt you because people are saying that they can't hear you very well, and maybe you could type instead, given the the background noise. If you want to share yeah. um, that in the chat, that would be great. And so, um, sorry, thank you, thank you for that. And we'll move on then um, to Mayada's group, and I believe Ariana was um, the reporter for that group. Yes, that was me. Um, we had a really wonderful discussion, uh, and I think that we really all appreciated Mayada's presentation. Um, we talked about a lot of different things, and Mayada asked the question, you know, what is the best approach um, to start changing policies and start making transformations? Is it the economic approach or is it the social approach? And with the social approach, we have to also look at, um, you know, break down different intersectional elements um, to pay attention to that at the community level. And we talked about, you know, the balance between that needing to find a balance um, between both the economic approach and the uh, social approach. Um, but also the balance between data and narrative of, of lived experiences when we present um, this, this topic for policymakers and also in the social sphere when, when we want to make those transformational changes. Um, and uh, Shriana also jumped in and you know, added that there is a large, when there is large economic growth, there's a sharp decline in women's employment. Um, and when people bring this data to policymakers, uh, a lot of the times there's a panel of men sitting in front of them. And that's not just true in India, but in the United States, as some people pointed out, and in um, lots of other countries as well. And there's very strong mindsets around um, that decision-making. And the word feminist can sometimes be, be too much and there needs to then sometimes be, um, you know, nuanced ways of, of discussing that, uh, especially with people with strong mindsets in, in, the, in the power of decision, who have power in decision making. Um, and I'll stop there so I don't run out of time, but it was a very meaningful conversation. Great, thank you so much, Ariana. Um, let's head over to Nima's group talking about entrepreneurship. And I believe that Bhavana was the reporter for that group. So Bhavana. Yes, um, I was. So we had a very interesting conversation um, and definitely the time was not enough. Um, interesting in a sense that we had, we started, um, actually the question that prompted our discussion was mainly about when we are thinking of this female default enterprise, uh, how has this, how, what, what should we do to have this cultural shift because it has long been male uh, default. So we uh, started this conversation for hearing the perspective from Africa and then moving on to Singapore and then Europe and then Asia, South Asia. So the generally what uh, 
came up in the discussion was that usually this kind of conversation is informal. So it's very important that we start having the discussion in the policy level. But it also is important when you think when we think of policy, it's also important that um, we start working from the ground level because feminist transformation in economy is not uh, easy uh, because even, even in like Europe, there are multiple spaces where women is with the numbers of women are higher but because of like gender based violence or violence to women uh, the the num the it's it's very difficult it's it's very challenging to get the uh, outcomes and the other thing that came up was that um, it's also important that uh, we need to uh, figure out like what is important, in, especially in terms of like when we are thinking of having a female CEO, then what kinds of education or what kinds of mentorship is in, is needed? Because even for the female uh, female entrepreneurs or female CEOs, it's very difficult to find their position in their own organization and have that voice. And here, a very interesting, uh, important perspective that needs like further discussion uh, is that. Uh, COVID came out as a great opportunity to, for, for creative destruction. So what else can be seen uh, as uh, one of the, or can be seen in, in the similar spotlight for those sort of creative discussion to have that female uh, default in any like economy or enterprise. So yeah, that was the main uh, highlight. Uh, I would just like to stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Hey. Much. Um, and just uh, to, to check out our chat where Anthony has been um, posting some of the uh, high level report on what happened in the <clears throat> tertiary education room, um, the conversation around, you know, what could we have done or what do we need to do differently to change patriarchal norms um, and the, the pointing to the need for more peer um, peer to peer networks and role modeling for young people. Um, media, the role of media in allowing for honest discussion and spaces that foster self-belief in young people by allowing them to have healthy conversations and changing patriarchal, patriarchal education systems by introducing a gender equality curriculum as early as possible. So those were some of the pieces that came out of that conversation as well. Um, and now I'd like to turn to our presenters again um, to share with us some of their closing thoughts from the discussion today. And really, you know, I think um, when we talk about holistic change or, or this type of systemic change and changes that you all have pointed to, often we can feel sort of overwhelmed and don't know where to begin. And as one of you mentioned, I think it was Mayada, you know, talking about culture. Well, culture is so huge. So where do we begin? Um, and if we think about, you know, moving into action and moving this conversation into action, what is sort of a, a takeaway that each of you have from the work you've been doing, but also from the conversation that we've had today in terms of where should we start? Um, what should the priority be? And this is going to be a tough challenge because I'm going to give each of you about one minute. <laughs> um, so a really concise statement of sort of what is the priority for taking action and moving forward with this? And why don't we start with you, Mayada? For me, I, I, I've learned with all these pieces, bring them together, that you cannot do it alone. So I believe in the power of network and the power of working together. So you need a critical mass, you need enough people together to create change. And I believe that every person's work is a piece in a puzzle. Together, it creates the big picture and I know there are a lot of impatient policymakers and impatient you know and all they want is change from top down and they want it quick but I think it is a, a process and I think each one of us is a small part of this puzzle that works together and I think what's most important is to understand the cultural um, cult to have a cultural understanding what is the true narrative rather than exporting creating your own knowledge co-creation of knowledge with people themselves with communities themselves to create change so like a network and a piece of puzzles together to create the change great thank you mayana um shayana what do you see as a priority for action as we move forward i think we have to work with men um masculinity working with men men's groups on these issues and starting young is going to be absolutely critical and the second is women in leadership all studies all evidence show when women take on decision making roles there are strong peer peer level effects demonstration effects there are different decisions that imply 
And I think globally, through affirmative action, through incentives, different kinds of policies, we should be thinking of just populating more and more women in the decision-making systems around the economy. I think that's going to be really critical. Thank you, Shayana. Um, Nima, what are you seeing as a priority for action? Thank you. Uh, COVID-19 has given a great opportunity for me it is difficult to do a piecemeal talk. Uh, you have to go to the mainstream and that's what the default matters. For example, uh, suicide was a crime if you commit before. When your default is reset, I always say, when you commit a suicide, is it a society's problem or individual's problem? So when the default is set to no, you are a victim, the whole the narrative, social narrative changes and things move in different direction. So that's why I still believe that the setting the default female system is important for the man and for the humanity, for the economy. After COVID-19, we have shown that the other half of humanity matters. So I still believe that it is the good for, important for the man to have a default female system uh, in place. And that's a priority. Great, thank you, Nima. And Aranjuti, we'll wrap up with you on, on your priority for where we should be working um, in the you know, immediate, immediate term. I definitely take away the role of culture and the soft power of, or, of movies that, uh, that Shayana spoke about, because I think um, with all of this work that we do with young people, that um, they, they are, I've only found them always willing to discuss things. And it may not always be that you have, you're starting from the ideal, but young people are always just open and willing as long as you engage with them. So I think that the idea of using movies to have that deeper introspection about what they may have seen, what they may have internalized, challenging that, um, and, and using that as then the basis for their everyday lives, right? Because like we saw the, the decisions you're making about whether to do housework, whether to support your partner, whether to uh, allow somebody in a meeting to speak up, those are everyday decisions that are being in, influenced by so many things that are often very subconscious and, and I think movies are a great way to have that conversation with um, young people. So I'm looking forward to bringing that into the, the mentorship program. That's a great point, thank you so much. Um, and as we come to a close, I want to um, invite all of you again to return to our Padlet. Um, and I was happy to see that uh, there had been some additional uh, participation in the Padlet during our conversation. So please, everyone, you know, take a take a moment when you have a chance to go through and and read through some of the comments of the other participants. But we'd love to invite you all to add to this around what ideas that you're taking, um, you know, for action and priorities as we move forward after today's dialogue. And also what questions you still have. Um, and you know, we can see we have a few questions here already. Um, but please, you know, feel free to add in um, you know, this, this question around the care responsibilities and the impact of that on the on the pathways. Um, you know, the this seeing gender equity successes for young people across economic class systems or only for girls or women at the top. This is a crucial question um, as several of our our participant or our presenters talked about today, you know, we need to have clarity around who, which girls, which young women um, are we talking about and make sure that we are reaching the most marginalized um, women. And the value of elevating women's employment or leadership translated into data for all, um, especially to policymakers. I think that, you know, for those of us who work and work with policymakers and, and trying to it, um, inform policy, this is always the question about what will motivate policymakers to action, what kind of information and evidence and how can we connect them. Um, and, and back to Mayada's point around sort of feminist research too, right? And, and narratives and all of that. And so how do we change some of those real lived experiences into um, types of evidence that can be compelling for policymakers? So um, please take a moment um, to share uh, your thoughts and for action and the questions that you still have in the Padlet. And again, we'll be sharing this out with everyone that was um, here today and everyone who registered for this conversation as well. Um, also saw in the chat a few people who um, were reach saying they would like to continue the conversation. Um, so we will be sending out and the registration we asked if people were willing to share their contact details. 
and we'll be sending out those contact details um, to people who are interested because as we mentioned at the beginning, you know, really the idea of these dialogues is to create an ongoing conversation. We know that an hour and a half is not enough time um, to solve these, these problems that are really systemic um, and entrenched and require work from all of us in all of the sectors that we work in and all of the countries that we're based out of. Um, you know, and really want to continue that conversation with all of you. So um, just want to uh, thank everyone um, for being here. Um, also, we want to do an evaluation, which we'll be putting into the chat as well now. So um, if you have a few moments, it should take about two minutes or less to just answer a few questions um, aimed at helping us improve these dialogues. So that would be great. If you don't have time now, we'll be sending the link out by email as well. I want to thank our Kidna alumni scholars, Aranduti, Mayada, and Nima, as well as the Gender Equality and Education team and our comms team at CUE for, for putting this event together. A special thanks um, to our guest, uh, Shrayana Bhattacharya, for being with us today. And finally, thank you to all of you um, so much for joining us, for bearing with us when we had some technical difficulties. Um, as we mentioned, we'll be sharing everything out, the recording, the slide decks, the, the graphic recording, the Padlet, um, all of the materials from this event. And we hope to see you again very soon. So thank you and have a great day, a great evening, a great night, wherever you may be. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.